testimony, and I mean just instantly within an hour or two of her being healed, he was talking about how that this happened because somebody sent a free tape to England that sat there for 15 years in a drawer, and it was that free tape that our partners sent that caused his daughter to be healed. And then our website had all of our things free, and Ashley has always been appreciative of that. And I tell you, every one of you who are partners with this ministry, you don't understand how much you are enabling us to do, but we are touching people all over the world. And every one of you who's a partner, you, you've got a part in that. People are going to come up in heaven and actually thank you for the impact that you've made in their life. That is not an exaggeration. That's not something we just say for an offering. You are making a difference. We couldn't do what we're doing. You know, every person's life that's being changed this week. I've got down here a number of testimonies. I didn't bring them up, but people whose uh, pelvic uh, bones were healed. I had one guy come up and talk about that he was uh, driving down the road and he was 50% deafness and his ears were opened and on and on and on and on you could go. And all of these things, you have a part in every bit of that. When we get to heaven... Nobody is going to think, I wish I'd have had more, you know, toys, more this. I'd have had my fifth flat screen TV, that I'd have had a nicer car. After all of this stuff is gone, the only thing that lasts is the way that you impact people's lives. And you are going to have people come up and thank you for your partnership, the way that you've invested in the kingdom. And I guarantee you, uh, we're going to see things from a totally different light. And it's to our benefit to see it now so that we can use our resources and get involved. You know, uh, they've already passed these things by. We aren't receiving another offering, so I'm not sharing this for any purpose except for your benefit. But I went to um, uh, Merritt Island, Florida, many years ago when we were building a building down in Colorado Springs. And the pastor there, Dan Stahlbaum, uh, they had about 300 to 400 people in the church. And Dan Stahlbaum said that the Lord told him that he was supposed to give a $50,000 offering for me that week while I was there, which that's just a huge offering compared to what I'd normally get. And he was praying and saying, God, how could our people give $50,000? And what he did was take a second uh, Corinthians chapter nine, verse 10, where it says, God gives seed to the sowers. And so he said, you may not feel like you can give, uh, much money. But he says, I'm believing that there's 50 people among these three, 400 people that if God gave you a thousand dollars this week, would you give that thousand dollars in this offering? So see, that was no risk. It said he gives seed to the sower. And so he says, if God doesn't give you any money, you don't have to put anything in the offering, but would there be 50 people here that would be willing to give a thousand dollars if God gives it to you. And so there was 50 people that stood up and made that commitment and he taught them and he says, God, you know, it's just like what Greg was teaching yesterday. God will never give you just enough. He'll give you seed to sow and bread to eat. He will always give you more. So uh, anyway, he got up and just challenged the people. That was on Sunday morning. By Sunday night, there was already half a dozen people that had had over a thousand dollars come to him that day. On Monday night, there was a man that got up and he already had a thousand dollars in his savings account. And he was just going to take that thousand out and go ahead and give it. His wife and him had already written the check out and they prayed over it before he went to work on Monday. And when he went into his job on Monday, his boss called him in and promoted him and gave him a $4,000 per month raise. And they started giving these testimonies. And did you know that other people started standing up and saying, well, I'll take this deal because you know what? And they gave more than $55,000 for a three-day meeting. Man, that's awesome. And in a sense, this is what Ashley was asking you to do, to pray about it, you know? And so I just want to challenge you that there's some of you that want to give, but if you, you have to put your faith out there. These things don't happen accidentally. And if you don't make a deliberate uh, step in this direction and do it intentionally, then even if God was to prosper you, you wouldn't even recognize why it came and stuff. But some of you, you just need to make a deliberate decision and say, you know what, Father, I'm, I'm a sower. You give me seed. You give me increase. 
from some like an unexpected inheritance, a job promotion or or just whatever it is, you, you bless me and I guarantee you I'm going to sow it into the kingdom. If you would do that, God would bless you. And like Greg was saying yesterday, man, you need to be stretching yourself. You need to be, be believing for more than just enough to get by. I'm constantly, Jamie and I are believing for increasing. We got everything we need. Our house is paid for. Our cars are paid for. When we go buy a car, we always buy cash. We, we don't need anything and yet we're always believing for something so that we can give more. Amen. Amen. So there's some great, great lessons in all of this. I just want to say that I've had a great time. I have really enjoyed this. It's ministered to me. I appreciate Barry and Greg. Boy, they have been a blessing. And I appreciate your attitude. I tell you, you guys are fired up. It has been fun to worship the Lord with all of these guys who are so excited about the Lord. So... It's just been great, and I believe that God is doing something miraculous in people's lives. I believe that when you go back home, your family's going to notice a difference. I believe people are going to say, what happened to you? Your wives are going to say, man, you go back next year. They're going to like what they saw. Amen. And this is a little uh, magnet that we have. And this is that declaration of dependence that I was talking about last night. If you sign up, you get a choice between one of these as a gift, or we have an eight and a half by 11 of this thing that's suitable for framing on parchment paper. And uh, you're welcome to get these if you'll go on our website. Did any of you sign up after last night? Man, a bunch of you. The rest of you, if you didn't, I'd encourage you to please do that. David, you want to give these away? I think I got nine of them here. What? Oh, yeah, husband and wife, sign up separate. And if you got kids or over 18 or something, get them to sign up. But we would like as many signatures as we can possibly get. You know, one last thing I want to say before I get started here is that during the praise and worship today, uh, Daniel, you know, is singing How Great Thou Art. And I never hear that song that I don't think about. Uh, it's been 54 years ago. It'll be 55 years ago in May that I was standing there at my dad's funeral and I was sitting on the front row and he was in a casket just right in front of me, just a few feet in front of me. And that was his favorite song. And so they were singing, How Great Thou Art. And I remember as a 12-year-old kid thinking that this just doesn't compute. Here's my dad dying and yet we're talking about how great God was. I prayed for six months that he'd be healed and he wasn't healed. And I remember praying right then and saying, Father, if you're really great, then show me what your purpose for my life is. Do something with my life. Reveal yourself to me. And I really believe that that was the beginning of my spiritual journey. I got born again when I was eight years old. This was four years later. But when I was 12 and I prayed that prayer, God answered that prayer. And I never hear that song that I don't think about what God has done in the last 54, 55 years. Uh, and what he's done in my life. And if God will do that for me, a 12-year-old kid, man, what would he do for any person in here? God wants to move in our life. God has a plan for you that is better than your plans for yourself. Well, Lamont said that this morning about God has treated him better than he treats himself. I thought that's a great way of saying it. But man, look how you've treated yourself. Go get drunk, shoot something up that hurts you and costs you money and causes all kinds of pain and suffering. God would never do that to you. God treats you better than you treat yourself. His plans for you are all good. Man, it's awesome. But we have to cooperate. And this is what I've been talking about is having a spirit of excellence. You know what Barry shared this morning is a totally different terminology and different stuff, but it's talking about the same stuff. And uh, he specifically was making the difference between imitation and revelation. Or, um, those were some of the terminology. I hope I don't mess your deal up. If I do, you can tell me. But he was, he was talking about how we imitate people, but how we have to have our own revelation from God and stuff. Here's another way of saying that is, on the positive side, that you might see somebody who's doing the right thing. And here we've been talking, I've been talking all of this week about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And some of you might have been motivated to imitate their stand and to be bold and to do all of these things. But you need a revelation of why they did what they did. 
In other words, you don't just copy a person's actions, but why does a person act the way that they do? Once you can catch their heart and why they were the way that they were, that's how you get set free. So the very first thing I started talking about is you have to know who you are. You have a excellent spirit on the inside of you. And if you ever got a glimpse of who you are and what you really have in Christ Jesus, I guarantee you, you wouldn't be settled for you wouldn't settle for mediocrity unless you need to get a revelation of who you are. If you don't have my teaching on spirit, soul, and body, you ought to get that. That's the thing that transformed my life. And part of their thing, the second thing was that they were just courageous. They wouldn't compromise. They wouldn't change anything. And boy, we've got to get to where we do not compromise. When this world is trying to force us to compromise and tell us to be quiet, we've got to believe and we've got to stand up. What I talked about last night was how that Daniel was not only convicted and courageous, but he displayed it publicly. And I showed you that there were scriptural precedent for civil disobedience that we need to stand up and we need to stand against this culture for godly, righteous things. What I want to do to, this morning, and I've only got 30 minutes left, uh, but what I want to do in this short time is just share with you kind of why they did what they did. And I haven't got time to go through and, and show you all of these things in the book of Daniel. But I want to emphasize humility is a huge part of this. And you can approach this from a thousand different directions. But to me, one of the greatest characteristics of humility is that you put God and other people, what he has called you to do, ahead of yourself. That's humility. And if you see these other things about how God wants you to make a difference, but if you go out and try and do it in your own strength, I can guarantee you when they threaten you, when they persecute you and say they're going to do this to you, if self is still the dominant thing, if you love yourself more than you love God and, and more than you love what he's called you to do, you'll compromise every single time. It's just kind of like, you know, whatever is the most important to you is what you will always promote and defend. And you need to reach a place where you are not the most important in your life. These are, those are big statements, bold statements. Look over here in Proverbs chapter 15. Let me just share some scriptures with you. Proverbs 15, 33, it says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. We've talked about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and how they prospered and that God promoted them and they rose to be over millions and millions of people because there was an excellent spirit in them. I can guarantee you a large part of that, what made them able to do that is because before honor is humility. God isn't going to promote you if it's all about you. This is something that people have hard time understanding, but... The Lord, because he loves other people and because he loves you, it's God that's holding some of you back. And some of you think, well, I thought God was a good God. He is a good God. But he doesn't want to put you in a position of leadership if you're going to wind up hurting and abusing people. And this is what selfish people do. This is what people who are all wrapped up in themselves do. They hurt people. And he loves you so much. If, if God puts you into a position of leadership, if it's godly leadership, I guarantee you, you just had a huge target drawn on your back. Satan is going to fight against you. I talked about that some yesterday, that if you never bump into the devil, it's because you're both headed the same direction. When God begins to start l putting you up, and putting you in a position of leadership, people are going to criticize you. And if you are a selfish person that is in love with yourself and you have to have the acclaim and the validation of other people for you to feel good, then you'll be destroyed by the criticism and by the persecution. You know, I was in a minister's conference in Greeley, Colorado, and Across the front, there must have been 50 people. I was speaking in a minister's conference, and I spoke, I forgot now what I spoke on, but there was about 50 people that came forward for prayer. And I started down at this end, and there was a guy standing on the very end, and I just skipped him. And I started with the second guy, and I went down the row, and I prayed with every one of them. And when I got down to the other end, this guy had gotten back in line, and he'd gotten down here because I didn't pray for him. You were at this, Daniel. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about or not, but... Anyway, he was down at this end. So when I got down there, I just quit before I got to him. 
And anyway, this guy grabbed me by the arm and says, why won't you pray for me? And I said, you don't want me to pray for you. And he says, yes, I do. I want you to pray for me. And I said, are you willing to take whatever God gives you? And he said, yeah. So anyway, I prayed and I said, you've been rebuking and wondering why your ministry doesn't open up. And I said, it's God that stopped your ministry. Because he doesn't want you to hurt other people. And he doesn't want you to get hurt. And I'd never seen the man before, but I just knew these things. And I said, it's God that's hindering your ministry because he loves you and he loves other people. And anyway, I didn't know any of the details. Later, during that meeting, I sat down and talked to him. And he had been a homosexual. And he had just been born again, just, a, I mean, a short period of time, months. And he was wanting to go out and just reach all the homosexual community. You know, the desire was good, but he wasn't ready yet. And if he would have been in ministry, it would have been premature. He would have hurt people. He wouldn't have presented it in the proper uh, attitude. And he would have been overcome. And anyway, this guy, finally, we sat down and talked. And years later, he came to me and he says, you know, that was God. I realize now I wasn't ready. But he still kicked the doors down, got into ministry too quickly. And after just a few years of being in a ministry to homosexuals, he wound up being hurt by the persecution. And he's totally renounced the Lord, quit serving the Lord, out of the ministry and everything. And you know what? It was God that was holding him back because God cared more about him than just using him and seeing him destroyed and thrown to the side. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but before honor is humility. Before God can really promote you, you've got to have the right attitude, and you've got to realize there's something more important than you. There are things that are bigger than you. What God has called you to do and the way that it touches other people is more important than whether or not you benefit from it. You know, one of the things, and, and no... We aren't perfect here. I'm not trying to present that. But one of the things that's working well here and that we're doing good is that there's not jealousy among all of these speakers and stuff. You know, the musicians. Paul Milligan leaned over to me this morning and looked at this front line, Daniel and Greg and, uh, man, I just went blank. <laughs> Matthew, Matthew and then Lamont and all of these guys and Marcus. And he says, look at this lineup. It's miraculous. They, we, these are some of the best singers, ministers on the planet. And they're just all standing here. And you know what? There's no competition. Amen. And we're here to glorify the Lord. And we don't have to be the one that everybody gets top billing. You know what that is? That's humility. Amen. And it's one of the reasons that things are working the way they're working. is because I'm not jealous of Barry. Man, I praise God that people like Barry more than me. <laughs> Amen. That's just great. Because I chose him. So I get credit, amen. I don't mind that people like Greg more than me and stuff. I just think that this is great. And there's just, there's not this competition. If you get promoted and don't have these things worked out, pride would kill you. The Bible says in James chapter 3 verse 16, where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. You open up a door to anything the devil wants to do when you are in strife and in pride. And if you're one that if God was to promote you and you were to begin to start taking credit for it, Satan would eat your lunch and pop your bag if you take all of this for yourself. Jesus said that I am meek and lowly in heart. That is his nature and character. And as long as we are still thinking about ourselves and promoting ourselves, you just... Uh, insulate yourself from being used of God. Man, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these guys were willing to lay their life down and give their life and die if that's what it took. It wasn't all about themselves. Man, that's powerful. Over here, let me just read another verse. says the same thing in chapter 18, in verse 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Same thing. Chapter 22, verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Man, we talked about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were promoted to riches and honor and all of these things. And it says before that happens, there has to be humility. Brothers, we have presented a 
some things in front of you this week that are good, and if you go out and just try and imitate it and follow those things of humility that allowed it and allowed these things to happen, you're going to lead to frustration and failure, as Barry was teaching. You need to get the same heart. These men had a commitment. They loved God more than they loved themselves. You can talk about humility from a thousand different angles, but you know what it is? It's really seeking first the kingdom of God. It's loving God more than you love yourself. It's putting God first. What would the Lord want you to do? What is God's will for you? We have people all the time that say, God's telling me to come to school, but, and then they give all of the reasons. And I just, I just can't understand. If you know God told you to do something, why would you put any but in there? You just do what God tells you to do. Well, but, I had a guy say one time, but, but I'm living under a bridge. I don't even have a place to sleep. I said, we got bridges out here. We had people say, I, I'd like to come, but I got two dogs. We said, we have dogs out here. Bring your dogs. It's just amazing. If God tells you to do something, you just do it. You know what that is? That's humility. You just get to the place to where God knows better than you do. God's smarter than you are. Look over here in James chapter 4. James chapter 4 and in verse 6, but he giveth more grace. Did you know that God is gracious? But there are varying degrees of grace. There is grace for salvation. There are graces for these different gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Over in Romans chapter 12, it talks about prophesy according to the proportion of, of faith that's given unto you. God gives varying degrees of graces, and right here it says he gives more grace. Man, grace is important. Well, wouldn't you like to have more grace? Amen. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Did you know if you are proud, and again, pride can be defined in many ways, but if you are always focused on yourself, if it's always about promoting yourself, if God tells you to go this way, but you think this way would benefit you more, you know what that is? That's pride. That's self. And God resists the proud. The word resist here means to actively fight against. It's not that God doesn't love you, but God is a meek and lowly God. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart. How can two walk together except they be agreed? If you are always thinking about yourself and promoting yourself, you cannot really walk closely with the Lord. Look on down here. It goes on to say... It says, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God. This isn't a separate thought. How do you draw nigh to God? Through hum humility, through putting God first, through putting other people first. When you exalt yourself, it actually pushes God away. Keep your finger here, but look back in Psalms 138. And in verse 6, it says, Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. You want to draw nigh to God? He knows the proud afar off. You'll never get nigh to God. You will never have the relationship and the things that you desire as long as it's all about you, as long as you're going to use God to promote yourself. It hinders God. He knows the proud afar off. He resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Let me share another passage over here in 1 Peter chapter 5. This is basically the same thing, but a different author writing it. 1 Peter chapter 5, and in verse 5 it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Here's two witnesses in the New Testament, and actually this is a quotation from Proverbs chapter 3 
and verse 34. And so here's three times in scriptures that it says that God resists the proud. Again, he doesn't resist you in the sense that he hates you or dislikes you. But God resists that pride. That pride is an expression of the devil. I don't know if you knew this, but there was no pride before Satan. Satan said in Isaiah chapter 14, I will exalt myself above the throne of God. I will sit on the sides of the north. I will be like the most high. You know what that was pride? That was pride. He was exalting himself and it originated with the devil. Man, if I had time, I'm talking as fast as I can, but if I had time, you could go on and show that all lying is a result of pride. Satan is the author of all lies. John chapter 8, verse 44. He's the father of it. Any time a person speaks a lie, any time you exaggerate, any time you try and make things look better to make yourself look better. You know, among preachers, it's like, how many were there at the men's advance? Oh, there were thousands. <laughs> when, you know, there's like 800 or 900 or whatever it is that we've got. But you know, you evangelistically, you just expand it and stuff. You know what that is? That's lying. And you know what it all comes from is an insecurity, a desire for people to feel good about you. And so you will manipulate, you will say things that present you in a better light. It's all about you. It's all about self. You take a person who is dead to themselves and they will not lie. They will not exaggerate because they're content. They find their identity in the Lord and they don't have to embrace. They don't have to toot their own horn. You know, my dad used to jokingly say, he that tooteth not his own horn, the same shall not be tooted. And that was, I thought that was scripture until after he was dead and I went to looking for it and found out that wasn't in the Bible. But there's a lot of people that believe that, that you have to promote yourself. But God says he would promote you. It says in Psalms chapter 75, I believe it is, 76 or somewhere right along there. Promotion doesn't come from the east or from the west or from the south, but it's the Lord that puts up one and sets down another. You don't have to promote yourself. Somebody says, well, if I don't promote myself, if I didn't do these things, who would do it? God if you would humble yourself. But when you are promoting yourself, when you are pushing yourself, when you are exaggerating things and overstating it and doing these things to make yourself look better, you eliminate God's promotion. God doesn't promote that. He said, my glory will I not share with another. As long as you are taking the good things that God has done in your life and you are presenting it and you are receiving the glory for it, it hinders God. And it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, What do you have that you haven't received? And if you've received it, then why do you glory as if you haven't received it? Why are you acting as if it's yours? You know, some of you in here are very talented in all kinds of things, and you can work with metal, you can work with wood, you can build things, you can do machinery, you, you just can, you, you know, you've got all of these different talents represented in this room. But the truth is, God's the one that gave every one of you whatever talents you've got. It's God that gave them to you. And you may not recognize, and you say, oh no, I went to school. I've worked hard. I've studied. You can't develop what God didn't put in there. You know what? You know, I can sing. I can carry a tune. I like the way I sing, but I'll, I'm just never going to sing like Matthew, like Daniel. These guys, they've got a gift. They've got an anointing that I don't have. And it's, it's a gifting from God. It's an ability from God. Now, they do things to develop it, but it's a gifting. Your, your abilities are gifts from God, whether you recognize it or not. And the person that God will flow through is a person that will give all of the glory to God and not take it for themselves. But God is not going to promote you if you're promoting yourself. Amen or oh me. And I'm telling you, this is one of the things I believe that really describes a person with an excellent spirit is a person who recognizes that it's God, that they're humble, that they give God the credit, that they submit themselves. They put God ahead of themselves. And if their decrease will benefit the kingdom of God, then let it be so. Amen. If somebody can run this ministry better than I can, praise God, we'll let them have it. 
You know, if God told me to go to Africa and, and live in a grass hut and minister to those people, and if I knew for sure that was God, I'd be glad to lay this down and let somebody have everything we got and walk off. My relationship is all about God and what God wants me to do, and this is what God wants me to do, and so I'm committed to it, I'm focused on it, but if he wanted me to do something else, I could walk off and let somebody else do it. You need to evaluate some things, and you need to humble yourself. And to me, this, this is what um, Barry was talking about this morning. Don't just come in here and try and imitate what you see these people in Scripture doing and stuff, but why were they able to do things? Because you know what? They had put God first in their life. They were willing to suffer, to die, to do whatever. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to get to a place to where you love God more than you love yourself. And I tell you, that is, that is really the heart of this excellent spirit is living to where you're living for God, you aren't living for yourself. It's not all about yourself. If I had more time, I could share with you like Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride comes contention. Only. And yet there's some people that say, oh no, my whole family, I mean, it's just in our genes. That's not what the Bible says. The only thing that makes you angry is your selfishness. It's just the fact that you're focused on yourself. If you're, a, if you're an angry man, if you fly off the handle and stuff like this, you may relate it to, well, it's what this person did to me. No, it's, what, it's what's on the inside of you. You could take a corpse up here and spit on the corpse, kick the corpse, ignore the corpse, insult the corpse, and if it's a corpse, it wouldn't respond. If you're dead to yourself, you can literally get to a place, it doesn't matter what your wife's doing, what your boss is doing and stuff like that. I know that some of these things I'm saying just saying this is impossible. You don't even know what you're talking about. Well, don't wake me up. This is how I'm living. And I'm telling you, I've had people do things to me, accuse me, lie about me, slander me. And in a week's time, I totally have forgotten it. People have to remind me that they've done it because I just don't. It, you can't get into anger and into strife without being a selfish, self-centered person thinking about yourself. It is not your genes, it's your pride and your selfishness. You need to get that book, not for your wife, but for yourself on self-centeredness, the source of all grief. You know, I had a man that come up to me in Tulsa and he listened to that tape as he was driving to a divorce proceeding. He and his wife were getting a divorce. And he listened to that teaching on self-centeredness, the source of all grief. And man, he pulled off the road. God spoke to him, changed his life. He shared it with his wife. And for the last 20 years, they have been teaching marriage seminars all around the country and seeing people's lives get changed. This is something that will affect you in every area of your life. In giving, there's a lot of people, well, I'd like to give, but I, you just don't understand. I just don't have the money to give. You know what that really is? It's pride. I don't have any money. Again, you are looking only at your resources. You aren't submitted unto God. You are trusting your wisdom, and you're thinking you know better than God. If you would just humble yourself and say, God, I... It looks like the death of me if I do this, but you know what? You're God. I'm not. You said to give, and so I'm going to follow you. That's humility. If you did it, God would prosper you every single time. Self-centeredness, pride is the source of all of your problems. It's the source of your depression. You can't be depressed without being a selfish, self-centered person. Amen. Some of you didn't understand that one, but that's absolutely true. If you're all wrapped up in yourself, you make a very small package. And brothers, this is why some of you aren't being promoted. It's why marriage isn't going good. It's why finances aren't going good. It's why you suffer depression, discouragement. It's why you're intimidated and all of these kind of things. And it's just because you love yourself. You are the center of your universe and you need to change. We need to come to a place where we put God and other people first. And man, I've had a very short time to say these things today. I haven't gone into a lot of detail, but hopefully the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart. And there's some of you that just need to make a decision that you aren't going to be 
the Lord of your life anymore, that you're going to get off the throne and you're going to let God occupy that position. You know, every one of us need improvement in this. You never just nail it and you get it and you never have another problem. If anybody says, oh man, I died to myself 20 years ago and I've never had a problem since, they've never died to themselves. The only way you're going to ever get rid of self is if you come up here and we'll just kill you and you go home to be with Jesus and then you won't be selfish anymore. But as long as you're in this life, you're going to have to be dealing with self. And so all of us need to improve in this constantly. You just never totally get it figured out. But I'm convinced that there's some people here today that God is speaking to and you realize that, man, I, all I'm going to be able to do is to imitate until... I get my heart changed until I humble myself and I get, you know, by revelation that God shows me that he's God. I'm not. And you bow the knee. So I want to give an invitation and I want to pray with you if you're one that has never really done this. If you right now would just say, you know what, I, my whole life has been all about myself and that this is revelation to me. And today I want to commit myself to walking humbly with God. To humbling myself, putting God and other people, putting your wife, your children first. If, if this is new for you and you're, you need to make that commitment, I want to ask you right where you are just to stand and I'm going to lead you in prayer and we're going to make this commitment and I believe this is going to make a difference in your life. If that's you, just stand right where you are. All right, I'm going to pray for you, and I believe that God's going to do a miracle in your life. Amen? The Bible says that we have to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. It says we have to humble ourselves. If it's done to you, it's not humility, it's humiliation. Humility has to be voluntary. If it's imposed upon you, it's humiliation. So we are going to humble ourselves and you've already humbled yourself by standing in front of your brothers and just acknowledging that you've got a problem in this area. And this is the beginning of you beginning to put God ahead of yourself and not exalting yourself. So, Father, I pray for all of my brothers right now. And I thank you, Father. Thank you for the awesome things that you've done in our life. Thank you, Father, that you are so worthy to be praised that we can exalt you and put you first. And if we seek first the kingdom of God, all of these other things will be added unto us. Father, we believe that you love us more than we love ourselves, that you'll treat us better than we'll treat ourselves. So, Father, we want to put you first. We want you to be the center of our life. We want you to control us. Father, we want to love you so much that if standing up for you cost us something, we wouldn't even acknowledge it. Father, we would just be concerned with putting your kingdom first and glorifying you. So we lay ourselves on the altar right now. We make ourselves a living sacrifice before you. You know, as I'm saying this, in your heart, you need to be praying to the Lord right now. And you need to say, God, I just commit it all to you. God, take away. I give you rights to come into my life and show me areas where I'm selfish, where I'm promoting myself, where I've not honored my wife, I've not honored my children, I've not honored other people. Father, I just give you right to every part of my life, to every room in my life. I want you to come in and take control. I want to live for you. I want to be completely submitted to you, Father. We make this commitment right now. We lay ourselves on the altar and Holy Spirit, we ask for your fire to...